All right. So welcome to Understanding Medical Marijuana and Its Potential Benefits and Harms in Older Adults Living with Pain. So this event is brought to you by the Aging and Integrative Pain Assessment and Management Initiative out of the University of Florida College of Medicine, Jacksonville. We are funded by the Florida Blue Foundation in order to bring these webinars to our patient and provider audiences. So everyone who's tuning in tonight is set to listen only mode. Please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature to type in any questions or if you have any issues or anything going on, and we will go ahead and work to address those. So we're going to attempt to hold all of our questions and discussion until the very end. If there's things that come up that we do need to address along the way, we'll do so, but we'll probably hold things to the end so we can get uh, through our presenters tonight. And after our webinar, you'll be sent a link directly to our evaluation survey. Again, only will take you a few moments. It's going to provide us with valuable feedback so we can keep improving on this project as we go forward. And of course, again, funded by the Florida Blue Foundation. So we want to make sure that we're providing value to our funders. So tonight's webinar is recorded. If you're just joining us, I'm just letting everyone know as a reminder. And then I would like to introduce our speakers tonight. So I will go ahead and switch our slides. So um, today's presenters, we have Dr. Robert Cook. So Dr. Cook is a professor of epidemiology and general internal medicine at the University of Florida. Over the past 20 years, Dr. Cook's research has focused on strategies to improve health outcomes related to HIV and sexually transmitted diseases. He's the director of the Southern HIV Alcohol Research Consortium, or SHARC, which supports collaborative research and training related to alcohol and HIV infection across the state of Florida. Dr. Cook has led clinical trials of home screening for STDs, pharmacotherapy for hazardous drinking, and the use of continuous monitoring to change drinking behavior. And then our next speaker tonight joining him is Dr. Yen Wong, and she is an assistant professor of epidemiology. She has training and expertise in both psychology and epidemiology. Dr. Wong received her MS and her PhD in Child and Family Studies from Syracuse University in 2013. She joined the Department of Epidemiology as a postdoctoral research associate in 2014, working on NIH-funded projects on risk behaviors among rural to urban migrants in China. In 2016, she was promoted to research assistant scientist. With an interdisciplinary perspective, her research focuses on leveraging advanced methodology and new technology, such as wearables, to improve health behavior, monitoring, and intervention. So I will now go ahead and hand off the presentation to our speakers this evening. How's that look? Looks good. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Cook, and thank you for the introduction and the uh, opportunity for us to be here. I think both Dr. Wong and I probably have about 25 minutes worth of information to share with you guys, and then um, we'll take extra time to answer questions. Um, so in addition to the HIV work, uh, I do have some marijuana-related research as well. I have a, a grant from the NIH on medical marijuana, and, and we're actually part of this consortium for clinical medical marijuana clinical outcomes research which is funded by the state of Florida. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those things as part of the talk. Um, let's see. So just as far as disclosures, I do receive funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Florida Department of Health and the University of Florida, but I really don't have any other conflicts of interest to report. I don't work with any of the medical marijuana dispensaries or companies, or I don't really have any ownership in any stocks. So I'm, I'm truly interested in the health effects, uh, trying to be as neutral as possible. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you about, I have four learning objectives we'll go through here. Um, and again, this may be new for some of you, but could be very familiar to others. So trying to balance uh, that. But we're gonna define and distinguish these terms, cannabis, hemp, CBD, marijuana, and medical marijuana. And then we're gonna describe mechanisms by which marijuana could improve outcomes in older people with pain. And we're gonna, encourage you to think about, can you list several different routes of administration of medical marijuana and what might be their potential advantages or disadvantages? And can we identify potential safety issues to monitor in persons who are using medical marijuana? So in general, we're thinking here 
Uh, Dr. Wong is going to give you some more statistics about what's going on in Florida, but certainly there are a lot of people in Florida who are older and who have pain and who are seeking medical marijuana. Some of those have a lot of experience in their life with marijuana, but others, you know, are going to be very new to medical marijuana. And so again, hopefully we can give you a background on what's going on with them. And also, um, Dr. Wong will introduce you to some of the research approaches that we're trying to do to better understand what, what's going on. So as far as these terms, um, it can be confusing. So cannabis refers to a species of plant and these plants um, can have different names like cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and there's also cannabis ruderalis. And so traditionally when people had different strains of marijuana that they called sativa or indica, it was because they grew in these different species of the, the cannabis plant. Now we see them much more blended and people are, are growing these plants in, in different ways. And so there's a lot of hybrids. Um, but in truth, most of the stuff that we're seeing in Florida, both for hemp and for marijuana is coming from the sativa plants for the most part. Now within these plants, um, there are over a hundred different cannabinoids. Cannabinoids are, are chemicals that hit receptors in the bodies and there's one of the most famous is this Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, which we consider to be kind of a psychoactive component of marijuana. And there's cannabidiol, which is CBD, which we see in, for sale in a lot of stores in Florida. And, but there's a lot of others. There's a CBG, there's a CBGN. Um, and as you'll see, these components are what's making up some of the medical marijuana. There are also other compounds in the plant. Um, this is from Leafly, which is sort of a marijuana information site, but it shows that there's different terpenes that can be myrcene or pinene, carbophylline, limonene, and these supposedly can cause different strains of marijuana to have different types of effects. And so for people that want uh, something that helps them to sleep at night, in theory, they could choose more myrcene. Uh, if they want something that keeps them more awake during the day, in theory, they could they could choose more limonene. Now, a lot of this could be hype. A lot of this could be, uh, there, there is NIH research going on looking specifically at these specific terpenes and what happens in the body biologically. Um, but you'll see a lot of, you know, if you look at what's being sold in the dispensaries in Florida, there is a lot of, you know, promotion of this type of terpene, but the true medical effects, I think we still have a lot that we don't understand. So we talked about the species and strains. And again, these indica supposedly has more of a sedating in the couch type of effect where sativa is more alerting. This also could be relatively hype. Um, and it is, there's a lot of marketing going on when you look at medical marijuana and uh, you know, even for recreational marijuana, there's a lot of discussion about these things. Uh, we have relatively little science comparing directly in people, the effects of these different things. It can be very hard to study because there's a lot of different strains and these strains can be made into, they could be sold as the marijuana flower as you'll see, but they can also be put into different types of uh, you know, concentrates and, and modes of consumption. And again, whether these strains you know, have a consistent effect or whether they individually influence the outcome more than just personal preference, we're still trying to learn. And these strains vary by the percent CHC and CBD. So it is hard because at least on the strain side, it's hard to get consistency, but our research is, is trying to narrow in on some of the common things like, does it have THC or CBD? Now, um, in 2018, the United States passed an agricultural act that defined hemp versus marijuana. So they're both come from cannabis plants. If the cannabis plant has less than 0.3% THC, it's a hemp plant. If the exact same plant happens to produce more than 0.3% THC, it's called a marijuana plant. So if you look at them, they look the same. Um, now, if you take that hemp plant and you make CBD out of it, you can sell that CBD legally because it came from a hemp plant. If you take the similar plant that's a marijuana plant and you extract CBD from it, that's not allowed to be sold except for within the medical marijuana treatment system. And 
to the best of my knowledge, CBD from the marijuana plant is similar to CBD in the hemp plant. They, they should have a similar biological mechanism. And what would make them different is what else is, is being there besides the THC and the CBD. Um, in Florida, the CBD is also regulated more under the Department of Agriculture, whereas the marijuana plants and its various components are being regulated by the Department of Health. Um, just to remind everybody that cannabis plants really were a primary use for medicine up until about the 1930s. Um, I read that George Washington had several cannabis plants on his farm, um, but it began to get a bad reputation in the 50s and 60s um, and was classified as a schedule one drug and, and since and then had a lot of criminal stuff associated with it. And it really still is a schedule one drug. There are current bills being proposed in the federal legislation to change this. Um, but right now it is a schedule one and there are some medications that have been designed and, and sold based on components of medical marijuana. Many people are familiar with Marinol, which is a synthetic uh, tetrahydrocannabinol product and Epidiolox, which is a CBD based drug that is produced from a specific plant and it is approved. So these medications are approved, um, but marijuana itself is not FDA approved or um, you know, DEA approved, but it is legal in the state of Florida. Um, I'll just remind you guys, as we think about different types of medical marijuana, it can be a phytocannabinoid or plant derived. So again, most of the medical marijuana products in the dispensaries are indeed plant derived. It can be synthetic, so we can produce it. <clears throat> so synthetic marijuana like K2 or spice is a synthetic strain. Um, it, it does mimic THC, sometimes it binds to THC receptors much more intently than marijuana itself did. And those synthetic cannabinoids you know, on the street are, are illegal. And then there's the endocannabinoid system, which I'll mention to you in a minute, which also produces things that are very similar to THC and CBD, but they're produced by our, our own body. So medical marijuana can be defined differently by different people. Certainly, if you're taking an FDA approved medication obtained by a prescription like Epidiolox or, or Marinol, that makes sense that you could call that medical marijuana. And then if you're getting marijuana obtained from dispensaries with certification from a physician that Dr. Wong will mention, um, that is medical marijuana. You're, you're seeing a physician who's giving a medical certification and you're obtaining it from stores that are only selling medical marijuana. Um, and I, this last one, street, report, street reported, street-based use, self-reported street-based use. So that means people that are getting marijuana off the street, but if you ask them why they're using it in a research study, they say, I'm using it for pain or I'm using it for stress. So people can self-report that they're using mar mar marijuana for medical purposes. And at least in some of my research studies, we consider that to be more of a medical use, just that people can define the reason for use. Uh, there's, so there's nothing really standard. Um, now we think about the mechanisms of how I could improve outcomes in, in people with pain. Um, so I see the question here about ankylosing spondylitis and chronic inflammation. Um, so keep that in mind as you look at this picture, which is very complicated, but part of the reason it's here is because we are going to look at different types of marijuana and think about the, how it could affect. So the title of this is a conceptual model demonstrating factors associated with marijuana use four dimensions of marijuana use and the influence of marijuana health outcomes. So health outcomes for medical marijuana often are more clinical symptoms. And so they're very different than a lot of medical treatments that are designed to treat diseases or things that are objective like blood pressure. Um, so most of the people using medical marijuana are using it for a symptom like a pain or stress, anxiety. Um, we do think that Cognition and behavior certainly are influenced by acute marijuana use. Um, and the type of marijuana, how frequently people use it, how much they use, uh, mode of consumption is similar to the mode of administration. And then certainly how much THC or CBD or the strain type, all of these things could influence it. And one of the mechanisms is through the cognition and behavior, but the other we are really interested in is systemic inflammation, systemic stress, 
and things even like the gut microbiome. And to answer uh, Mr. Pasquarello's question, you know, we don't really have evidence of any, I don't know of any studies on ankylosing spondylitis specifically, but certainly we do see studies showing that many inflammatory markers are decreased in people and my own research is in, in people with HIV and they have a lot of systemic inflammation as well. And, and so far the data really do suggest that components of medical marijuana, we don't know exactly which ones or which combinations do seem to reduce systemic inflammation. And that could have a nice outcome for people with all types of chronic disease because we know that people with high levels of chronic inflammation are associated with worse chronic disease outcomes, more rapid aging and even earlier death. So it is intriguing to think about the potential of marijuana use in older people that, that could be beneficial through this sort of inflammatory pathway. And the way it works on inflammation is through the endocannabinoid system. So this picture shows that CBD1 and CBD2 receptors are located throughout the body. Um, we tend to think of CBD1 receptors more in the brain and, and more, again, thinking of the psychoactive activity or some of the truly acute symptoms you might get if you were just using marijuana, uh, whereas the CB2 receptors are more on things associated with our autonomic nervous system, um, things like our inflammatory cells and things like the gut and gut microbiome. So these receptors in the body are part of, um, you know, our system and the endocannabinoids are actually coming from nerves. They are actually neurotransmitters that are very briefly released into the circulation and there's types of feedback loops. So they're really hard to measure the endocannabinoids, but they do act on these same receptors that marijuana would act on. And again, CBD itself, I consider it to be a type of medical marijuana also hits these receptors. And sometimes there's a balance between if you give people both THC and CBD, they, they might compete more for one receptor or the other. But um, a lot of people think that having both together kind of really complement each other. Other people want to see the effect of each uh, specific cannabinoid individually. So it could have direct effect on pain on inflammation via endocannabinoid activity. But other people who, we did some qualitative interviews of people with pain. One of my PhD students, Verlin Joseph, interviewed people with pain about how marijuana helped them. And many of them said, well, it does take the edge off the pain and, and reduces it. But many of them said it didn't completely stop the pain, but yet there were psychological effects so that when they were using marijuana, it took their mind off the pain and, and therefore it kind of distracted them and let them feel better. Uh, many people said that they felt less stiff or more mobile and, and they say, I get up, I move around. Um, and then a lot of people said that they sleep better and that helps them to be less irritated by the pain. So when a lot of people, you know, anecdotally say, yeah, the medical marijuana is helping my pain. I want you guys to keep in mind, it could be that it actually is literally stopping the pain, but for many people, there could be many other ways in which they, they say they feel better. Uh, if, of course, you know, we'll talk about side effects as well, but if they feel better from the marijuana, it could be through some of these other mechanisms, not, not always directly through just the pain itself. Now, we did a study of, of 244 people with HIV that were using marijuana in Florida, and these are data from a couple, the last couple of years, and we asked them, these are people mostly from the, the street, how did they use marijuana, and you can see a balance that, but just by self-report, over half of them said they were using it for at least therapeutic reasons, and what it also shows is that many people use it for both therapeutic reasons, but they think they're getting a recreational effect. And for recreational effect, some people would say, yes, I just feel high and that's what I want. But other people might just say, I feel better or I feel relaxed or peaceful. And so it's a little hard to distinguish what that is. Um, now, as far as routes of administration, so if you do have a, let's say a 60 year old woman with severe arthritis who comes in has never used marijuana and, and she sees a medical marijuana doctor, and goes to a dispensary, they'll be faced with many different choices. Um, and the routes of administration can, can affect how quickly THC or CBD are absorbed. And that influences the onset, the intensity and the duration of the clinical effects. Um, and it also could influence things like dosing. So we are familiar in internal medicine with recommending that people use 
you know, pills, for example, every six hours or every eight hours and a specific dose. Uh, whereas marijuana seems to be much more people titrate to find a desired effect, um, which is challenging. And especially with all these different products, it can be challenging, but it can be smoked. Uh, the, the state legislature, you know, debates this every year and, and many people are very concerned about smoking this flower. Couldn't possibly have a health effect, but our data suggests that a lot of people do find it to be the safest and uh, most you know, consistent way to feel better. But there are these tinctures. And so the advantage in a tincture, it doesn't have the eyedropper in it, but usually there's a, a one milliliter uh, syringe. And so people can kind of dose specifically a half a mil in the morning and half a mil at night. Tinctures are often given sublingually. Um, and so the onset could be within about 20 or 30 minutes uh, and it wears off about four hours. Whereas if you're smoking it or inhaling it with, the, for example, a vape cartridge, then you might get the uh, onset of effect within seconds, uh, but it may wear off within a few minutes. I mean, a few hours or less. Uh, so people have all these different varieties. Um, shatter is a very concentrated source. There are oral pills um, like this as well that people can consume with the 10 milligrams of THC each, uh, but the you know, absorption is slightly different uh, for different people. And so all of these have sort of strengths and limitations and it can be a dizzying or rare you know, choice if people do go into a dispensary and are just faced with all these options and their doctor basically said, you know, talk to the dispensary people. We work with some physicians who do give pretty specific recommendations and, and the doctor I work with the most likes the, um, the tinctures. And um, I think they make a lot of sense because I think they, they can be dosed pretty safely. Um, you know, when we try to measure it, I'm not gonna go through everything on the slide, but it is, it's just hard to, marijuana flower comes in grams. You don't know exactly how much THC is in it. Even if it's labeled, you can question how precisely that label applies to this specific piece of the, the plant. Um, some of these are easier to dose in milligrams of THC. And the National Institute of Drug Abuse thinks that five milligrams of THC could be a standard dose. And that way we could, we could look and see how much THC people might need. Um, but, but a lot of people use it all day long. Um, some people focus more on single sessions. So it can be a challenge as a researcher. Um, so last, I was gonna talk to you guys about safety issues. So especially if you're a physician or if, even if you're a, a son or daughter of a, of a mom who's gonna go on medical marijuana or a dad, you know, what kind of safety issues would we wanna monitor? And, um, you know, accidents is certainly one thing we worry about. It's you know, car accidents people driving under the influence or driving under the influence of marijuana plus uh, alcohol. So I think we're all really concerned about that. And it's, it's hard to study because we don't really have breathalyzers for marijuana. Um, but we worry about accidents. We also worry about accidents if someone got dizzy and fell and you know just fell backwards in their house or got dizzy. So accidents we worry about. Interactions with prescription medicines is something that people don't think about a lot, but these uh, cannabinoids also you know, affect some of the enzymes in the body that break down drugs. And so they can have drug interactions. And if people are on prescription medications that involve drug monitoring, for example, they may need more close monitoring. Coughing and lung issues. Um, you know, a lot of people cough when they smoke marijuana, but it doesn't seem to have an effect on long-term lung disease with the exception of sort of illegal products that were made with a substance that caused, you know, vaping illness that, that was in the news last year, so we do worry about those. Um, people could become sort of addicted in a way that they spend lots of money on medical marijuana, but actually aren't achieving any health benefits, so that would be a downside. Um, some people have severe side effects, like vomiting or passing out, feeling dizzy, feeling paranoid. Uh, for most of these, um, you know, it usually happens once or twice, and people either stop using marijuana, say, I'm done, or, or they learn how to manage it so they don't keep getting these side effects. We do worry about addiction from cannabis use disorder and withdrawal, uh, we go back and forth. But I think once people start using marijuana daily, there is pretty good evidence that a, a large proportion will experience some withdrawal symptoms. It won't be as severe as opioid withdrawal, 
um, or even alcohol withdrawal, which both of which can kill people or, or make people really, really sick. Um, but, but again, if, if people are on marijuana for a month or more, they, they really may withdraw. Now, the good news though, is in terms of true health outcomes, there really isn't any strong evidence of marijuana causing cancer. For, for the most part, there isn't really strong evidence of severe lung disease with the exception of the illegal products. And there really isn't strong evidence of causing mental illness like schizophrenia or depression. Um, but there certainly is debate and we really don't have a lot of randomized trials. And, and so, so, so some people truly have legitimate concerns that kids could develop a psychosis or that people with a you know, history of mental illness might do worse. But you know, fortunately we don't have a lot of strong evidence showing any, any causal effects. And there's also no strong evidence to suggest long-term cognitive effects in adults. We know that marijuana acutely can affect short-term memory and decision-making, but in terms of people that use medical marijuana for years, there doesn't seem to be any, any evidence of harm in terms of cognition. Um, so I mentioned this vaping illness. We, haven't, we fortunately haven't seen any more of this, and it did seem to be all linked to illegal products, um, but it killed killed people. So I think we're still legitimately concerned about what could happen. Um, cannabis use disorder, I'll just, I've only got a few slides left, um, but basically we're, we're asking people about, did they use more than they intended? Do they have control issues? This is just sort of an example of a slide that we can use. And I will tell you that in the 224 people in our study, um, almost 80% had two or more of these symptoms. So a lot of people have some of these symptoms, but whether they really have a, a serious substance use disorder or not, I think is, is not clear. So if you are a general health provider, my advice to you is to be objective, um, be neutral if you want. Uh, there is potential for benefit. There's also potential for harm. I think it, it's always nice to create an environment where patients can be open and honest and, and let the doctors know what they're doing. Um, and I think doctors can and nurses can periodically assess for both benefits and harms. And I encourage you all to advocate for research and education because we really do need more information on, on how specific products influence some of these outcomes. So my last three slides are just telling you a couple of things we're doing now. Uh, we are this consortium for medical marijuana clinical outcomes research. I encourage you to look us up on the web. It was established by the Florida legislature to sort of who acknowledge that there's a lot of people in Florida using medical marijuana and, and we should do some more research. The infrastructure that Dr. Wong and I are part of is based at the University of Florida, but the consortium itself includes nine public and private universities within the state. Um, and the mission of the consortium is to conduct, disseminate, and support rigorous scientific research that contributes to the body of scientific knowledge on the effects of the medical use of marijuana. So we are looking at both safety issues and, and clinical benefits and um, have been funding $600,000 of grants per year to the state universities for the last two years. And we are also complete, com initiating a registry and a cohort study where we're going to enroll people that are starting medical marijuana and try to collect real time. Well, in this study, not real time data. Dr. Wong will talk to you about real time data. But we're going to try to do some surveys at two months and one year to sort of see what happens to people and try to link to some other health data. And so we are recruiting eventually from dispensaries and medical marijuana providers, industry partners. Um, so we, we are, the consortium is really trying to build some nice partnerships. We also need to recruit some control patients who have, for example, chronic pain that aren't in seeking medical marijuana. And so some of you may work in clinics that could be control clinics for some of this. Um, we do have a study called Maple that is enrolling in three cities in Florida and looking at marijuana and HIV. And this is a picture of our consortium. Absent Dr. Wong, who somehow, I think she took the picture. But um, anyway, that's the end of my talk. And I'm gonna let Dr. Wong probably go ahead and proceed. I'll look at uh, some of the questions in the chat and answer a few of them to the best of my knowledge. But. Okay, um, can you see my slide? 
Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I will continue to talk about medical marijuana and chronic pain um, with more um, research evidence and also talk about uh, the pilot study I have been doing um, in, in this area. So um, first, I have no financial <laughs> uh, conflict of interest. Um, and then for the content I will be covering, so first um, I will provide a very brief overview of the medical marijuana um, program in Florida and the user demographics. And then we will go over some current research evidence um, of marijuana's effect on chronic pain. And then finally, I will go over um, some of the findings from my pilot study, which um, looks at outcomes among uh, a group of uh, older adults who newly initiate medical marijuana use. So as many of you may know that uh, there are a list of uh, qualifying conditions that people can get medical marijuana for um, in the state of Florida. So there are a list of specific conditions like cancer, um, HIV, Crohn's disease, and there are some more vague um, conditions, um, medical conditions of the same kind, terminal condition diagnosed by a physician. And then uh, chronic for chronic pain, actually you need to have um, chronic pain and also a qualifying condition um, that accompanies the or cause the chronic pain um, in order to get um, the medical marijuana card. So just um, to take a look how many people um, right now in Florida are, um, are using medical marijuana, we have almost um, half a million of um, active medical marijuana card holders. Um, that means they're actively um, filling their so-called prescription of medical marijuana. And there are over 2,600 um, certifying physicians that are um, practicing in Florida. And then one of our studies um, by our consortium um, actually showed that uh, about 59% of the state's early medical marijuana adopters um, were actually older adults. Um, and the most common condition for their medical marijuana use um, were actually um, musculoskeletal disorders, uh, spasms, and the chronic pain. And many of them are also using other uh, medications, um, such as um, medications for mental health issues, um, benzodiazepines, um, opioids, and um, some of them are also on cardiovascular agents. So those are some of the statistics based on our early findings. Um, and then just a quick overview of um, Florida's medical marijuana users by condition. Um, so this is the new report just came out um, last month, I believe. Um, as you can see here, this is um, from 2019 to 2021, um, PTSD, um, and chronic pain are on the top two of, um, of the list. And then um, there's this medical conditions of same kind. And then when you look into the medical conditions of the same kind, um, you can see a lot of them are anxiety, depression uh, type of conditions, but the other half, uh, almost other half of them is um, chronic pain. So when you add all those up, um, chronic pain is um, still one of the leading causes for medical marijuana use. And then um, just to give you some idea what people are getting from our dispensaries here in Florida, this is just um, one week's um, data from all the dispensaries. And you can see a lot of them are getting medical marijuana, which is higher THC products um, versus the CBD primary products. Um, so it's almost 10 times more uh, high THC products. And um, also when you look at the smoking products, uh, which is flour and the pre-rolls, um, you can see that is also very popular in Florida. And this is just uh, the popular um, rods of administration. You can see inhalation, that's basically vaping and smoking, and oral 
um, and a lot of people are trying topical um, that's for chronic pain. So they use a lot of creams um, just to treat locally. Um, so where are we in terms of science? Um, since so many people are using them, um, we have to admit that most of the research um, that's being done um, on medical mar uh, on marijuana and its effect on uh, chronic pain are um, based on smokable marijuana, which is flower. Um, and then most clinical trials are based on synthetic marijuana products or um, marijuana flower that's um, provided by the University of Mississippi. Um, so there's lack of evidence on how real world medical marijuana from the dispensaries are um, actually working, like how well they are working and whether um, it's comparable to what we find um, using other products. And then there's also a lot of challenging studying, med uh, studying medical marijuana um, because they are way more diverse uh, compared to what we have studied in previous research. Um, and also right now, although the states of um, the state of Florida requires um, some third party validation of what they report on their label, uh, what they say, uh, how many percent of THC, how many percent of CBD in their product, there is not really a convenient way for researchers um, to actually validate um, what's in their product. So we're just taking uh, what they said. And then there's also legal barriers um, to do randomized clinical trial using um, medical marijuana products from the dispensaries. And also, as Dr. Cook mentioned, it's hard to measure medical marijuana dosage. Um, so there is this um, kind of comprehensive review by the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine that came out in 2017, kind of reviewed um, all the available studies between 1999 and 2016. Um, they reviewed uh, a variety of medical conditions that people use marijuana for. Um, and then there is um, a conclusion they made in general, there is lack of um, conclusive, um, con conclusive um, evidence for most of these conditions, unfortunately. And then when they reviewed uh, all the chronic pain studies, which include five systematic reviews and 28 um, RCTs back then, um, they draw the conclusion that there is substantial evidence that cannabis is an effective treatment for chronic pain in adults. And what is substantial evidence um, is defined as this. Um, so they have five levels of evidence. Substantial evidence is second best, I guess. So there are several supporting findings from good quality studies um, with very few or no, um, or no credible opposing findings. So a firm conclusion can be made, but minor limitations cannot rule out with um, reasonable confidence. And again, um, just a reminder, what they um, based on their review on is a lot of studies um, looking at smokable marijuana that's very different from what we see in Florida's um, dispensaries. And then our consortium also conducted uh, additional evidence review that kind of pick up where they left um, 2016. And um, we did uh, additional review led by Dr. Gooden um, and a national panel of experts. They did a review from 2016 to 2020 October. Um, so they reviewed 120 studies, um, including 16 systematic reviews, three RCTs. Unfortunately, all the RCTs are still ongoing, so there's no uh, findings um, to be reported yet from the RCTs. And then specifically, they looked at 17 studies investigated um, pain reduction or quality of life as the primary outcome, and 10 of them actually indicated improvement, and some of some of the, the other ones um, find a mixed, no change or inconclusive um, findings. Um, although there seem to be, again, um, substantial evidence supporting um, the effect on 
chronic pain, there's limited evidence for dosing and um, as well as um, which rod of administration is more effective. And this is actually reported in this paper that's um, forthcoming. If you're interested, you can look for that one. So there remains a, a lot of unanswered questions, um, including what type of products are more effective in pain relief, um, how does medical marijuana impact anxiety, depression, and sleep that are very common um, comorbidities among um, people living with chronic pain? And then um, can medical marijuana help people reduce or quit opioids? Um, there has been a lot of ecological study that look at um, Medicaid and Medicare data that kind of shows, um, some of them shows a positive relationship between state uh, legalizing medical marijuana and opioid dose um, reduction. Some of them didn't find um, the relationship. So there is um, an advantage to do a prospective study, kind of track people as they start medical marijuana to see whether there is a causal um, relationship. And also, is it safe for older adults with chronic pain to use medical marijuana? Because we see that a lot of people are using other medications um, while they get on medical marijuana. And also older adults, we have concerns about their cognitive functions, we concern about whether they will get um, so imbalanced when they are on medical marijuana and they um, kind of fall. So there is a lot of uh, potential risks we um, probably want to monitor. So um, in response to this um, need for more research evidence, I conducted a 12 month medical marijuana chronic pain pilot study um, with Dr. Cook and some other collaborators. Um, so basically what we did is we recruit older adults. Actually, we recruit adults. We didn't intentionally only include older adults, but we ended up with mostly older adults. Um, so from uh, medical marijuana clinics before people start medical marijuana, and we did baseline assess, sorry. We did baseline assessment um, to um, kind of ask about all their baseline health characteristics. Um, we also collected a uh, biomarker, which is uh, a aging biomarker slash chronic pain biomarker with um, its telomere lens. Um, so that's um, uh, kind of exploratory. We want to see whether um, it's feasible to, to do that. And then uh, we did the smartphone based real time assessment of people's um, pain level and whether they're in good mood or not. Um, so anxiety, depression. Also, we ask them about their daily sleep um, hours quality and sleep quality. Um, so we kind of have the baseline assessment before they start medical marijuana. And then after they start, we also keep tracking using uh, the smartphone-based ecological momentary assessment um, for a few more weeks. Um, and then at three months and 12 months, we kind of did um, again, a survey on their health outcomes. So we did recruitment from um, five different medical marijuana clinics. Um, so the inclusion criteria is really um, people who are adults um, planning to start medical marijuana with chronic pain as a May um, condition. So this is our sample. Um, we have 56 um, participants with the mean age of 55. Um, majority of them are white, 18% um, black and some um, Hispanic and uh, multiracial. Okay, and then uh, about 80% of them actually have um, had some college education or even more. And 55% um, had an annual income about, about uh, above 40,000. And when you look at their baseline paying, um, this is a group living with um, severe chronic pain. So their worst pain level is um, 8.0 um, on a zero to 10 scale. 
and on average their pain is about 5.9. And then 42% of them reported using marijuana uh, that's not medical marijuana in, uh, from a dispensary in the past 30 days. Um, and then we, ha we, we had a good um, follow-up rate, 92% at three months and 76 at 12 months. So this is just how uh, we did the EMA. We did a daily prompt um, at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, basically ask about their uh, last night's sleep, sleep quality, uh, medical marijuana use and other medication use. And then we also did um, several random prompts um, that occurs um, during their awake time, um, about four times per day. We ask them to rate um, how much pay you're experiencing right now on a zero to 100 visual analog. We ask them about their anxiety, depression. Um, we also ask about um, the product information um, that how long ago you took um, the dose and also uh, what's the route of administration. Um, and we also ask them to report any side effects they experienced. So this is um, just an example of how people's pain level um, look like after, before and after they start medical marijuana. Um, so this person, you can see they, have, they started off uh, with about um, 60 to 80 points out of uh, zero to 100 to um, visual analog. And then they kind of decreased over the course um, and then bumped back a little bit. Uh, this is another person, which as we can see, may, may not uh, have too much um, reduction, maybe even a little increase. And this is a person who showed um, actually very um, significant reduction in their real-time pain level. So um, when we look at all the 50 some participants data together, um, I conducted a multi-level model to see whether there is significant re reduction comparing their pain level before the treatment and after the treatment. So as you can see here, uh, the model shows there is significant reduction. Uh, that's about 17 um, points out of the 101 visual analog. Um, and then the graph to the right is actually a, a trend line that, um, that is based on 50 participants who completed their EMA. So as you can see, day, day zero here um, denotes when people start medical marijuana. So um, before day zero, the negative number days um, means the baseline assessments. And then um, after that, um, all the positive ones, all the, all the positive ones, um, you can see, uh, as you can see, there is a significant drop of uh, their pain level and it kind of levels off um, over time, but it didn't bounce back. Um, and when we look at different administration modes um, and how much pain reduction it produces um, using the same, same real-time um, data, we can see that um, flower actually produced the most um, pain reduction. It's about um, 18 points out of the 101 um, visual analog. Um, and then there is um, vaping sublingual and other. Um, so people also reported a lot of other use. We asked them to specify. Um, so I didn't look into what other uh, denotes, but it looks like other is also a, a good route of, of administration that can reduce a lot of um, pain. But it, as you can see here, most of them produce at least a 10 points reduction of their pain out of 101. Um, and then at three months, we uh, compared participants' outcomes um, in various domains compared to their baseline survey. Um, we can see here um, 
participants report a significant lower level of their worst pain, their average pain, uh, their pain interference, um, and also they report a significant reduction of their depression. Um, and then um, when we look at the daily opioid use, um, at baseline, over 50% of the sample reported daily use of opioid. Um, but then uh, at three months, it's only 28.6%. Um, so there's a significant reduction of opioid um, daily users in the sample. Um, and also, Patients report a significant increase in their um, actual hours of sleep. Um, so there's like 0.07 uh, hours of increase after they started medical marijuana. Um, they also rated their sleep uh, quality as better and also better quality of life. So we also did a brief follow-up um, at 12 months. Um, so at this time, 70 4% of the participants were still using medical marijuana. And among these um, continuous users, we can see a lot of them reported um, medical marijuana was moderately to extremely effective for chronic pain um, and helped them reduce or quit opioids. And they reported better uh, physical functioning, mental health, sleep quality. Um, and also quality of life, which is consistent with their three months um, outcome. And then on the other hand, we have to um, be careful uh, because there are potential harms that were reported by the participants. So for example, 35% um, um, of them said they needed a higher medical marijuana dose now to achieve the same effect compared to when they first started. 43% uh, reported experienced some side effects. Um, so uh, there's a variety of side effects people reported. Um, the common ones include a blur, a blur of vision, uh, dry mouth, paranoia. Um, some people reported stomach issues um, and also red eye, bad smell. So there's um, quite a range of um, side effects that people experienced. And then 21% reported worse cognitive abilities um, perceived by themselves due to uh, medical marijuana use. Um, so at, lastly, I just want to share some um, qualitative feedbacks from the participants, which I thought um, is kind of insightful. Um, so when they talk about um, how medical marijuana, so we have a question asking overall, how do you think uh, medical marijuana is effective or not? Um, so they commented on um, a few different aspects. So um, this is about opioid use and sleep. Um, this person said overall medical marijuana treatment was um, helpful, especially while going through narcotic withdrawal. Um, the other one said, I am no longer using my walker. I only take my meds um, one time a day instead of three, and I haven't had a Xanax in 30 days. Um, the, the third person said overall medical marijuana treatment worked. I slept better and it made my previous medicine more effective in that I didn't need to use it as much. Um, okay. okay, I think I skipped this one. Um, so this one, this slide um, include some quotes about pain and quality of life. Um, so this person said it makes it much easier to control pain and not take pills. Side effects are way better than tramadol medication. Um, on marijuana, you can live life, work and do stuff. Um, but on tramadol, you cannot live pain-free and do stuff. Um, the second one said, it's very effective being helping my pain when everyone had to go down on opioids because of the high death rates, I felt suicidal. It takes the edge off plenty when I feel human again. Uh, the last person said, it helps me move normally. When I would come from work, I would be a lump on a log and I wouldn't move, I couldn't move. And now I can move around freely interacting with my family members.
Um, and then in terms of side effects, um, this person said definitely pain relief. And I think toward the end, I started to notice some weight change. I started to lose a few pounds, but I could, uh, I could afford to lose it. So this person reported losing some weight. Um, my tolerance has increasingly increased drastically. So I have to do more of more potent stuff to be where I need to be. So this is increase in dose. Um, I started off smoking the marijuana and didn't like it. I didn't like the way it made me high. I got drops and the pills, the pills didn't do anything. So this is person um, didn't find um, medical marijuana very helpful and didn't like the feeling of being high. Um, so those are just some examples um, to show you how people feel like it. Um, and then just to summarize what we talked about, um, there's substantial evidence to support marijuana in treating chronic pain, um, although it, um, uh, sorry, my slides keep forwarding <laughs> uh, by themselves. So there is small to moderate effects based on the meta-analysis and reviews. Um, there is definitely a need for more information on dosing and administration modes. And our pilot study actually showed that older adults with chronic pain um, experienced both health benefits and also side effects from uh, medical marijuana use. And then uh, lastly, there's insufficient or um, no evidence for many of the relate pain related um, outcomes. Um, so definitely need more research. Um, if we can do randomized clinical trials they, uh, with the dispensary products that people are actually using that will be optimal. Um, um, and also we need better measurement of dose and all, uh, also the chemical compounds in the medical marijuana products. Uh, and lastly, I think I saw a question um, asking about whether um, people um, have different belief, uh, beliefs about uh, marijuana will have um, different outcomes. Um, so we did submit an R01 proposal last year and one of the reviewers comments is actually, um, we should um, look at individual differences in terms of um, their expectancy of how marijuana will work um, for their condition. Um, they think that will be a strong um, factor that could impact their outcomes. So there's definitely this um, impact there. The psychological factors could uh, make a difference. If you expect marijuana to work well, um, you may have uh, better results, but um, I think it still depends on what kind of product you use and the actual outcomes. So there could be some placebo effects, um, but eventually that will wear off um, if over long term there's no benefits then. I think that um, expectancy and um, placebo effects kind of wears off. Um, and also um, there is a question about different pain um, types. So that's actually one of our hypotheses in the proposal. We want to look at different pain phenotyping um, at baseline to see whether people um, fare better with certain type of, uh, types of pain. And there are some, um, sorry, there are some um, research findings regarding different um, types of pain um, that I, I think there is a meta-analysis that's showing um, good result for neuropathic pain. So uh, with that, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, my staff, and also um, the uh, community collaborators who supported our recruitment. And the, um, I want to thank you for um, funding my pilot project. And that's the end of my talk. Okay. If you go ahead and stop your share, I will go ahead and just show our final slide here before we get into the Q&A. Okay. 
Okay. So thank you so much for uh, Dr. Cook and Dr. Wong for joining us and being able to present this today. We did have a lot of people who are really interested in this topic. And again, as a reminder, if you join kind of partway through or you had a specific question or something you might want to reference, again, this is recorded. So we'll be posting that and sharing it with everyone so that you can reference it later, share it with other colleagues and all that good stuff. So now it's time for the Q&A and discussion portion of our day. So if you have questions that did not pop up through the presentation that you've not already asked in the chat box, we can also go over some of them aloud if there's anything that um, Dr. Cook might have seen popping up more frequently. Uh, we can go ahead and discuss any of that out loud. But if you've not submitted a question, just go ahead and feel free to use either the raise hand feature or the Q&A chat box is very helpful. And we can go ahead and answer some of those questions that you might have at this time. And um, while people are kind of thinking about if they have any new questions, um, Dr. Cook, was there anything that you saw coming up that you might want to address with the whole group? Well, I think the, you know, the relative safety of vaping versus uh, non-vaping is a you know, public health concern, both for people who are vaping nicotine, um, as well as people who are vaping you know, marijuana components. So if you go into a dispensary, you can get vape products that are all THC. You can get vape products that are, you know, have ratios of THC and CBD. You can get products that are mostly CBD. Um, and, you know, the state legislature was initially didn't want flour or, you know, what traditional marijuana to, that you smoke to be allowed. Uh, but, some advocates got it passed. And um, so in our research, we are asking both the marijuana providers and the uh, patients to help us understand the differences between vaping and, and using flour for similar products. And the doctors all thought that the vaping could be used more consistently and you know, dosing could be more consistent, but the doctors also one thought that flour might have a better overall health effect. And again, a lot of people believe in something called an entourage effect, which means that there is something combined all in the plant that, that has a better outcome compared to if you extract it and put it in chemicals. And so you know, one is more natural, one is, one is you know, produced. But I, I think it's a really important question because certainly lots of people are vaping. And other than the ones that cause the lung illness that were made illegally, uh, we haven't seen severe harm from vaping marijuana or marijuana components. But anecdotally, uh, several people say that they have a, a harder time using vapes. Although we did have one of our uh, participants in the chat say that for at least uh, them, the vaping really was, was very effective and helped them get off of other more serious prescription pain meds. So there's a lot of individual variation uh, and some of the expectancies could be related to people's previous experience with marijuana as well. So people who have had previous experience with marijuana, again, certainly may have expectancies based on that experience. Uh, but, but we are seeing, and in Dr. Wong's study, a lot of new people that are, you know, haven't really used this before. And it's an exciting time because chronic pain is so difficult both to have it um, it's miserable, but it's also difficult to treat as a provider. Um, and medical marijuana does have some intriguing results here, as you saw from Dr. Wong. It doesn't stop the pain completely, uh, but yet certainly for most of the participants that were in her study, they all felt better at a year. Mm -hmm. We did have an additional question come in as well. So this one, again, if, if this is all IRB related, it might not be answerable today, but they're asking about which licensed medical cannabis operators in Florida have agreed to participate in such research studies may or may not be something that you can share and just asking about, can we be certain as to the margins of error? Well, I'll take this one on and Jan, you can add it. So the, there are, you know, somewhere between 13 and 19 uh, medical marijuana treatment centers, what the dispensaries are called, that are 
allowed to operate in Florida. And, you know, a lot of controversy around whether we should limit it. Um, now, legally, none of them have, you know, we've talked to several of them and, and we're willing to work with any of them who can work with us. But so far, none of them have explicitly said that we can use their products. And if any of them did, it would be a first because for the most part, um, in order to do research on medical marijuana, legally in the United States, a researcher like myself or Dr. Wong needs to get the marijuana product from the National Institutes of Health that gets it from the University of Mississippi. And the, the products of the University of Mississippi are different than the products that are being sold in our treatment centers in Florida. So we really would like to try to study treatment centers in Florida. Now, if you do operate a medical marijuana business in Florida, you are required by the legislature to send each batch uh, to a lab. And there's two labs in Florida that are independent and that can test not only for the components of marijuana, but they also test for pesticides, they test for hard heavy metals, they test for fungus or yeast, uh, they test for you know, fertilizers. So I think that in some ways we should feel safer getting the marijuana from the dispensaries compared to off the street. Um, but as far as how consistent they can produce their products, um, you know, I, I think reasonably well. And as to their margins of error, I can say that if we were to do research with any <coughs> company in, in Florida, um, we would want to independently send a sample of whatever we were using in that study to a lab for an independent assessment of what it actually is. <coughs> I hope that answered the question. Thank you. I think that sounds good. Um, let us know if, if that question has been fully answered, uh, participant, just by letting us know in the chat. And then again, if anyone else has any additional questions, feel free to use that Q&A feature to let us know. Um, but otherwise, we'll give that a few minutes and I'll continue on um, sharing a little bit more information for all of you guys who've stuck around toward the discussion portion. So we do have our post survey, so I'm going to pop that into the chat box, so that way you all have access to that. It's going to be shared out to everyone um, via email, I'm losing my words here, and um, you'll be able to respond to it within about two to five minutes super quick, super brief. Again, that's the post survey. So we do encourage everyone to provide us with feedback that way. Um, and then I don't know if you've answered this question. So this one came in through the chat. So uh, the efficacy for impacting pain and various methods of delivery is interesting, especially with the extremely low level with use of pills versus the other forms of medical marijuana. What could be some reasons for this? I know you've touched on that with you know some of the vaping and other options, and it sounds like it's just based on availability of, of the options and which dispensaries they're going to. But if you want to discuss that more, if you're seeing anything from providers who are prescribing or anything like that. Yeah, and do you want to try to um, comment on it? Yeah, if you're talking about my findings um, that compares different modes of consumption, um, because I'm asking um, people to rate their real time pain and um, because you know for the oral, um, the pills, they usually take a long time to um, start showing effect. That could be, um, they took a pill, but then um, after a few hours, they only started to, um, experience effect. So their pain reduction in the real time is not um, as significant as compared to vaping and other uh, and smoking. So that could be one reason. Um, and also, um, I, I don't know if there's any um, metabolism differences, like how cannabinoids are processed in the body when it's taken as a pill. Um, they might have um, turning to different um, metabolites that's not as effective, but there, there's definitely needs um, for more research to compare. And also um, in, the, in my study, I didn't factor in the dose um, as additional effect, um, as an additional uh, factor, because we know we need 
both uh, su sufficient dose and also um, a good rod of uh, administration to have effect. So um, that could change after we took into account of the dose. And I, I would just add it again with, with chronic pain, if you look at you know traditional medical treatment of chronic pain, um, and truly these are people that have pain every single day, a lot of people recommend both a long acting pain medication that kind of helps you know, provide relief all day long in addition to some short acting things that can, you know, if, if you need help. Now, even a short acting pain pill takes 30 minutes to an hour to kick in. And one of the appeals, I think, for a lot of pain patients with a vape pen or even flour that they might smoke in a pipe or a joint is that it would give them relief pretty quickly. And then if for whatever reason they did get any side effects that they didn't like, um, they would know pretty quickly and they could just not use anymore. And uh, one of the problems with the edibles is that people may be in pain and use the edible. But as Dr. Wong said, an hour later, they don't feel anything. So they take more, um, but, and then they take more because they don't feel anything. And then all of a sudden this cumulative effect happens and, and people have essentially, you know, taken more than they intended and, and now, you know, essentially can't function as well as they want to. Uh, people may also have different consistencies based on if they are eating on an empty stomach or a full stomach. And so I think that people are, there's an appeal to the long acting aspects of the edibles and the pills, um, but, um, I, and, and I think in our survey that we're gonna design for the people in dispensaries, we're gonna ask people all the products that they've tried and try to get them to describe the strengths and limitations of the different modes of consumption. So hopefully we'll next year we can come back and say we actually have some data on what people see as the advantages or disadvantages of the different modes of delivery. Dr. Wang, are you familiar with some of these um, specific pain? So someone in the question and answer is, is talking about C fibers or, or different types of fibers in the, in the body. Have you read anything looking at the mechanism of marijuana specifically on? Mm, no, I don't, I don't think there, I, I'm not aware of any literature that look into very specific um, things. That's why we're trying to look at different um, pain phenotypes. But um, in our research, we, uh, we refer pain phenotypes um, as um, like how severe your pain is, number of sites, complexity of your pain. Um, it's not um, really um, what the biological, it's more like um, categorize the pain um, with more detailed dimensions. Okay, and it looks like she shared something as well, um, an article that we can grab out of there and I can share with each of you um, looking a little bit more into that as well. But if anyone doesn't have an additional question at this point, the contact information for myself here with the AI PAMI program is shown on the screen, as well as for Dr. Cook and Dr. Wong. And again, we'll answer any other last minute questions that might come in. I will pay attention to that. But on behalf of the AI PAMI team, we'd like to say thank you to all of our speakers, all of our attendees, and of course, our video conferencing team that makes the webinars possible for us as well. We hope that you found the presentation, both of them, both presentations to be valuable today. And again, remember to fill out that post survey or look out for my email. So I'll be asking you to help us provide some feedback and learn a little bit more to improve these moving forward. Um, again, we really appreciate when you're able to do that for us. So for more information on our program, you can go ahead and reach out to myself if you're interested more in the topic or anything like that, discussing the research, uh, the presenter's information is listed up on the slide on your screen, but I don't see any additional questions uh, coming in at this point in the chat or in our Q&A. So if there are any concluding remarks from either presenter, you can go ahead and share that now. And 
Uh, if not, then we will all break away for the evening. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. And thanks for having us. Uh... Thank you.